Salutations. I do find YouTube a most intriguing and idiosyncratic environment and place and it is true anarchy with anarchy inevitably people organize themselves into groups of meaning and purpose and sometimes they don't I'd like to start talking about a community which isn't so much a community but which I find unifies around the concept of being quote-unquote unproblematic so I don't know why I decided to look up the meaning of unproblematic person, but I did and I learned something. So according to Google, an unproblematic person is somebody who is not problematic, not causing difficulties or confusion, uncomplicated. Now this definition of the unproblematic person is all adjectival and by this I would refer to the full definition of what an adjective is. A word belonging to one of the major form classes in any of numerous languages and typically served as a modifier of a noun to denote a quality of the thing named, to indicate its quantity or extent or to specify a thing as distinct from something else. Interestingly, the adjective is not for the benefit of the subject or the thing being described, namely the noun in question that is being modified. The adjective is for those who are trying to understand the noun more intimately and intently. And of course, with all words, the significance of the word unproblematic comes from its counterpart, problematic. And the weight of the term unproblematic and problematic, in fact, has significance on a platform such as YouTube, in which being considered one or the other really determines the trajectory of your channel and your audience perception of you. However, I do see a contradiction in the term because on the one hand, the adjective is meant to give the individual or the subject in question, the noun, more nuance, more descriptive nuance. And like most modifiers, it distinguishes what is being described from the rest. Yet at the same time, it simplifies. And as Elise so eloquently put it in her video titled Unproblematic. But I really don't like the word unproblematic. What do you even, what does that mean? What does that even mean when you describe a person as unproblematic? I'm aware that the types of people who use these who use the term unproblematic, probably young. Of course, I know what they're getting at when they say that, oh, look, that influencer is unproblematic. Emma Chamberlain, unproblematic. I see it a lot when it comes to influencers. Really like this person, they're so unproblematic. You are just setting yourself up for failure because unproblematic means that someone has no problems whatsoever and that just simply isn't human. It's dehumanizing to use it. I really don't like this word. It dehumanizes the subject, the person in question, the noun, because ultimately it deciphers that person and claims to understand the complexities of this person in terms such as uncomplicated, unproblematic, unconfusing, not difficult, etc. I also get a lot of tweets from people that are saying like, we love you, you unproblematic queen which always makes me uncomfortable because I'm a person. Those of you that are familiar with how long I've been on the internet know that that's not true. And this all implies a simplicity and an order of things. It implies a sort of easy chronological trajectory of a person, their career, their channel, who they are. And I think this is fascinating because the lack of coherence in the term's usage corresponds to the dilemma and pressures faced by the unproblematic YouTuber who somehow has to retain a successful YouTube channel while not resorting to sensationalism, to inauthenticity, selling out, controversy and the truckload of expectations placed on them by parasocial relationships and the general viewer, sponsorships and the algorithm and how it constantly changes. So in considering unproblematic YouTubers, I would like to focus specifically on a handful. The following YouTubers that I'm going to focus on are Ingrid Nilsson, Emma Chamberlain, Elise, Nicole TV to an extent, Joanna Sadia, and best dressed. I'm not going to talk about Kelly Stamps because I am getting a bit... 
I am getting a bit frustrated of uh, Kelly stamp stands coming and sending me rather peculiar threats. Uh, so, you know, we're just going to reference that she's a part of this, that, you know, I include her in this and, you know, that's great and, like, you know, I'm done. <laughs> How long do you think Beatlemania will last? As long as you all keep coming. <laughs> There are noticeable characteristics about these unproblematic female YouTubers, one of which is that they have a very dedicated and loyal fan base. Their fan base are not even necessarily your atypical fan base, in my opinion. There is an element of a parasocial relationship that goes on. And I think this is because one of the things about these YouTubers is that they very effectively and uniquely break the fourth wall between themselves and their audience. And I feel that they do this because of their personality. I would say it's personality over content or even quality of content. And that is what I think is at the essence of why they are unproblematic. Personality trumps everything. It comes before politics. It comes before community allegiance. It comes before everything. I think that with these YouTubers, they fall into sort of two broad categories in their personality traits, which an audience can relate to. They either represent the atypical cool girl, the girl that an audience member wants to be. You want to be what she is. And then on the other hand, they represent an anomaly, basket case, if you will. They're very unique and very exceptional in they do very weird things, they say weird things, and it's inviting, it's very intriguing to watch and you sort of can't stop watching. I found this when I was watching Joanna Sidia and her content. I just kept watching and watching and watching and it wasn't that I found her content particularly engaging or interesting. However, there was something about her which drew me in. And this is when I noticed it and I noticed that, oh, this is why people find these kinds of YouTubers unproblematic. They could put out into the world a video of them just sitting there humming Kumbaya and they would get tens of thousands of views, which is what they get. And again, I think that this is because of how uniquely personable they are. There was a large variety of dishes. It was honestly mesmerizing. There were spring rolls, vegetarian cutlets, vegetarian samosas, and whatever the heck this is. Obviously, I took multiple of each. I was here to try everything. That complicated thing I can't pronounce, turns out it was deep fried cottage cheese. I mean, hello, I will take 10, please. My dad even went back for seconds. I'm not one to talk though, because I ate more than my fair share, that's for sure. Suddenly, the lights dimmed. Something was happening. We observed as the groom sat on the stage. Everyone was silent. Something was brewing. The doors closed. We were locked in. There was no going back now. The minister was chanting something. Knots were being tied. The doors, they opened, and... It was just my dad coming back for thirds. Good job, Rolando. Thanks for being a real party pooper. Remaining relatable is a difficult paradox of being unproblematic and consequently oftentimes successful. I found it so interesting how, for instance, Liza Koshy and Emma Chamberlain both did interviews for YouTube and Vogue at the Met Galas, demonstrating the levels of success and exclusivity they have accessed via their YouTube fame. Liza couldn't retain relatability and she hardly posts unless she's promoting something on her channel. Emma, on the other hand, still does YouTube and remains relatable and idiosyncratic without it seeming forced or a facade. However, time will obviously tell. I think the interesting thing that Emma Chamberlain has done with her content is that she has changed her content. The perfect word for it is solipsistic. Her content is very solipsistic and it has changed and morphed from being highly edited, a bit over-dramatized, kind of quirky, not like other girls, visco girls sort of vibe to it. By the way, most of my furniture is from Urban Outfitters. And here's my living room. I actually don't have a TV. Look at what's across from me. No television because television runs your brain. And so I didn't want one, but I do have this yellow couch. One time one of my friends uh, leaked period blood onto this couch. 
you know who you are to being very a very good amalgamation of serious thoughtful and raw in which she can make a video about how awful her bowel movement has been. I think her secret is that she's able to very much on her YouTube channel distinguish between Emma Chamberlain's solipsistic mentality relative to Emma Chamberlain, the high profile celebrity, influencer, vogue, whatever representative, the face of. You wouldn't think from her YouTube videos that she is all of that, but she is and that can cause a problem but i think her personality overrides so much of that criticism that may come her way insofar as people saying oh emma chamberlain hasn't bathed for a week and it feels that people are just trying to look for things to hate on her because it's very difficult to see particularly with these relatable unproblematic youtubers whom you followed and seeing something of yourself in them gain all this success gain all this notoriety and still be considered human and it's difficult because one thing that we all have to accept is that these unproblematics are exceptions to the rule of life they may be relatable but that doesn't mean that our lives will inevitably mirror theirs or that our lives can mirror theirs. Meritocracy is a bit of a myth to be fair, actually it's a big fucking myth to be fair and I think this is also where parasocial relationships come in where we see so much of ourselves or we see something that we want to be in one of these unproblematics that we form a sort of relationship to them. I personally think that parasocial relationships are inevitable depending on what content you're watching on YouTube. It is something however that has to be addressed and that you have to do what is right for you in those situations. Let's get personal. I have quite literally only used YouTube in order to keep up to date with the life trials and tribulations of Amberlynn Reed. That is basically my life outside of um, my job and reading Dostoevsky. Um, <laughs> So it was quite intriguing when I came across Kelly Stamps' channel. I started watching Kelly Stamps and this was when she was very, very small. She had under 50,000 subscribers. I did find that as she got more successful, I found myself less able to relate to her. And there is a contradiction in this, in that you want these YouTubers to succeed. I wanted Kelly Stamps to succeed and she has and she is. But a consequence of that is that unavoidably she's going to change how all of these YouTubers eventually change and that's okay. But I think that's when you really do have to reckon with your parasocial relationship. And so instead of watching her content as religiously as I did, I have stopped watching her content like all the time and I see it more so as catching up on what Kelly Stamps is doing and sort of watching her videos once in a blue moon. I'm still subscribed, I still sort of know what's going on, I think more so for an analytical reason because she's absolutely fascinating but I don't necessarily see myself as relating to her if that makes sense. I think for the same reason I'm subscribed to lots of other people, Amberlynn Reed, Trisha Paytas, Nikocada Avocado. Wow. So in answering the question why they're unproblematic, I would say that this is primarily because their personality being the one and only and most central thing to their content and what attracts people to them is advantageous to them in other ways as well. It means that in relying on their personality, they don't rely on trends, they don't rely on a community, they don't rely on the standards set by being a part of a certain community. So there's a lot lot more freedom for them to actually really be themselves and everybody loves authenticity and I think it is with these kinds of creators that you can really see authenticity. They are not performing based on the criteria pre-established by a community and its audience. They're running their own show and that gives them the leeway to be themselves. So there's nobody to compare them to. There's no standard. There's no 
other people within a community to compare them to. And that is, I believe, to their advantage, at least whilst they're making content and whilst they are not noticeably changing and evolving. I also say this because I think it is when they become a part of a community or when they befriend other YouTubers from communities that are already established, that are problematic or controversial or which have a standard and expectations of their creators and the YouTubers who they value, that they then become problematic and that the issues start to arise. It is by being a one-woman show that they succeed in what they do. I actually was inspired to make this video because I recently watched a video that Elise uploaded on her channel titled Unproblematic in which she speaks about this very issue of being called unproblematic and I have noticed this that among her very very loyal followers there is this general perception that she is unproblematic and I can definitely see that in the sense that she somehow is able to make commentary videos on drama but at the same time stays out of drama herself. When she covers these YouTubers and when she does do this more commentary style content, she gets considerable views, far more than her counterparts in the, I would say, drama tea commentary community. And I think that this demonstrates also the unproblematic aspect of her. She is able to move into this community in such a way but at the same time isn't necessarily a part of it because she's considered unproblematic which gives her opinion and what she makes on these youtubers on these scandalous beauty channels and uh, beauty youtubers seem credible and i do think that's why she gets a lot of views with that there have been huge crowds of teenage girls outside complaining that they don't want to mob you they just want to speak to you what do you think about this do you want to talk to them well, have you ever tried talking to about 200 people at once? <laughs> We'd love to, you know, we yeah. never, we, if we all wave and if somebody always says, oh, just stop that waving, you're inciting them. As being somebody who is unproblematic, you can't change. You have to remain true to the perception that your audience, particularly your very loyal audience, has of you. I found Ingrid Nielsen to be a very interesting example of this because she was a highly unproblematic influencer. She started off in the beauty community and I found this quite interesting because contemporarily you don't usually associate somebody in the beauty community with being unproblematic because what drives the beauty community, at least now, is the drama, the tea, the sensationalism around it. And I think that this was a factor of why her channel quote unquote died. Unproblematic influences within the beauty community tend to fall under the radar. She was also a bit of an anomaly in that her external appearance, her very feminine attributes and concerns with beauty and lifestyle were completely contradicted by this major announcement which she made about six years ago in 2015. Alright, um, I guess I am just going to get right to it. Um, there's something that I want you to know and that something is I'm gay. <laughs> it feels so good to say that. <gasps> so good. And I did bring tissues. So I feel that Ingrid's coming out video was a win and a loss all at the same time. She was being relatable, real and completely raw. But at the same time, this Ingrid did not fit the perfect, the unproblematic persona the internet had of her and which her audience had inevitably fictionalized. So in the short to midterm, this was not a problem for her channel, I don't think. Her channel became more mature, she gained subscribers and she gained views. Even though she continued to do makeup, she began to expand her content, which displayed her personality more. 
She focused more on subjects that people wanted to know about, but never spoke about at a time on the internet in which this was a revelatory thing to do. The importance of communication in relationships, especially about sexuality and preferences in the boudoir. What was interesting about the trajectory of her channel is that she started off by not giving a lot of herself personally. It was very much tutorials on makeup and looking at how celebrities do their makeup and how you could mimic that. And it only gradually, as she sort of found her footing, that she then started to actually give a lot more of herself. And I think the interesting thing was, is that even though she hadn't been terribly personal in her initial years on YouTube, her personality was what really brought people to that content in the first place because she had a very, her demeanor was very warm. And I found myself, even though I had no interest in cosmetics and makeup, that I was drawn to her initial videos as well because I could see that this was a very genuine, sweet, kind person. And then when she made her content far more about, I would say herself, but also educational things and talking very openly and candidly about female sexual empowerment, it was just a bit of a, I would say on initially seeing it, a mindfuck because she seems to be very prim and proper, very put together. The type of person who stereotypically you'd think would never ever talk about, you know, sex in the open. But she approached it with such maturity, such candidness, and it was just like everyday conversation. Especially in the last few years, I've just been really down in terms of like my like my career and just my feelings around it. I've felt really discouraged with like the change in algorithms on different platforms. And I was definitely in this space of, okay, what can I do to make the algorithms like me? What can I do to make people like me more? What can I do that like other people are going to like watching? Now, I think something that always happens with the unproblematic female influencer is this paradox of being problematic, unproblematic. Let's call it the problematic, unproblematic dichotomy. The more successful they get, inevitably, the more problematic they appear to get. And this is nothing to do with them, I feel. This is all to do with their audience and their growing viewership. And I think inevitably, when on YouTube, you for instance are uploading one video a week and you've got a small audience who consider you unproblematic, once you gain subscribers and once you start making bank, uploading one video a week is going to seem like no work at all. Realistically, it's gonna seem like nothing because that is how our minds work. If you are perceived to be doing no work and you're not making money from it, then it's fine. But if you're perceived to be doing no work and making bank, then suddenly it's a huge issue, even if that isn't realistically the case. So it isn't that they actually put less work in, but rather that the bar of success has inevitably morphed with the growth and solidification of the unproblematic image and persona which they have. That is, a high level of success with seemingly little effort and a glorious lifestyle to match. And I think an unproblematic YouTuber who's really had to deal with this is best dressed. There is a very good video on YouTube by a creator, I cannot remember their name, but they made a very interesting, very short video about how it isn't best dressed who is problematic, it is her audience. And I agree 101%. I've noticed with her content that she makes very, well, I think all of them are quite self-deprecating, which is a part of the appeal, but she makes very explicit, nonchalant, sexual jokes, like very just goes for it. She's very open about having a very unusually high sexual drive and she's quite happy to make jokes about sex. I mean, if she was a guy, everyone would be like, hey, great, you know. Oh. Okay, nope, the blazer is too much. Looks like I'm going to an interview. Interviewing for a piece of that dick, if you know what I'm saying. Oh God. Fucking badger. I had a guy over and I had to explain that there was literally no furniture in my room, but we may do. 
that is too much information. Anyway, honestly, my sex drive has gone up a lot. Now that's good and bad because David got very tired of me wanting to have sex all the time. Have you tried to sneak into the hotel? Yes. Yes, we were in the hotel. <laughs> How far in did you get? 12th floor. Have you ever been this crazy about any other entertainer? No. And that's what's so amazing. We don't know why we're like this. I think the most these YouTubers can expect of themselves is looking after themselves. And if that needs to be done off camera, then so be it. Fortunately, they find themselves in a good enough financial place to do this more frequently or indefinitely. For instance, best dressed. And I think in these examples that I've used, it's evident to see how they have responded to the pressures of being unproblematic in their own ways. Kelly Stamps was expected to live in New York City, was expected to be the NYC vlogger. And now she's left New York and that was a considerable sacrifice, at least in views. Joanna Sidia, for instance, no longer shows her subscriber count, even though she's getting considerable views. Her views generally stay the same and she also uploads less frequently. I know that this is due to health issues that she's been suffering from, but I think at the same time, there hasn't been that drive to communicate as intimately with her audience. Joanna has always lived with her parents, but her parents have featured very much in her content, at least in so far as being a sort of offstage presence and a contributory factor to her quirks and her traits. So that's going to be interesting to navigate and that is going to be something very interesting i think for her to navigate but also again pressure and then again a lot of these unproblematic female youtubers just leave the platform but it is also clear that these unproblematic creators found youtube to be an escape it was a comfort a virtual friend where they found community support and an outlet for whatever they were going through at the time it has now morphed into something way beyond their control once the label of being unproblematic and uncomplicated hits them their personality and outsiders perception of them is not even of their own making or crafting anymore. Thinking from the perspective of content, what others think of me, what others expect of me, how others want me to be, can strip the individuality, the idiosyncrasy from the creator, taking away what made them the enticing, unique and amusing individual they once were. Everybody is just human and it's important for us as viewers not to idealize how human somebody else is because with idealization comes inevitable disappointment, comes pressure being placed on that individual and also pressure on us as viewers. I think the pressure that it places on us is more to do with our own expectations of who we are with comparing ourselves to this image that we have of a particular unproblematic influencer. And yes, there are those influencers who purposefully go out of their way to make sure that we think that their lives are perfect, to think that they are unproblematic. But there are those who are just living the human experience and are in the small minority of people whose individuality and personality have made them incredibly likable, successful, and rich and that is the world we live in i'm neither here to condone it or otherwise i just think that everybody needs to look after themselves in this sense because there are huge pressures on being unproblematic but yeah that's my take um thank you so much for watching and i will see you in the next one